Good evening and welcome to the public board meeting for SC 72 Campbell River on this May 14th, um, 2024. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the uh, Campbell River Board of Education is here seated on the um, territories of the Likuto peoples and uh, we'd like to thank them for their stewardship of these beautiful lands and waters so that we may live, work and play here. Um, please note that there is a 10 to 30 second production delay between the live event that you are viewing and meeting participants. And the question and answer function is open online for questions on agenda items throughout the meeting. The final call for questions will be made after the last agenda item and questions will be addressed at the end of the session. So I'd like to call this meeting to order and begin with my chairperson's remarks. On tonight's agenda, we will be discussing an upcoming event sponsored by the District Parent Advisory Committee for an event they were they will be hosting called It Takes a Village. Parent groups have been actively involved in education in BC for over 95 years, and in 1989 and 2002 respectively, legislative changes were made to the School Act to recognize their collective <laughs> voice in providing input to government on many educational, health and safety issues affecting children and youth in BC. Parents and caregivers are a child's first and best teacher, and when that child reaches the K-12 system, they become their child's best advocate. By exploring, uh, by exploring how to become involved at a school level as a PAC member, you support not only your own child, but the entire school community. Parent advisory councils are about more than running fundraisers and hosting hot dog sales. They are a conduit into a deeper understanding and connection to what happens during your child's experience in the K-12 system. I would like to take a moment to thank all of those adults who volunteer to enhance the schools across this district through their commitment to building a vibrant village of caring adults for kids. This evening, Secretary Treasurer Patrick will be publicly presenting Senior Management's 2024-25 budgetary recommendations to the board. This budget cycle sees SC72 in a surplus position of approximately $500,000. Prior to the beginning of the yearly budget consultation process, finance was predicting a slight, a slight deficit for the next year. The Ministry of Education and Child Care releases final budgetary allocation numbers to districts historically no earlier than March 15th. We acknowledge that this shortened window often feels rushed to gather feedback from our partner and rights holders groups. But due to the late release of the final numbers, an accurate representation of the school district's future financial position is impossible. The board has heard the request from the field to extend the consultation timeframe. And although there may be room to begin crafting a wish list of enhancements of enhancement of services as early as January, no calculations can be made until the final numbers from the ministry have been confirmed. SD72 Campbell River is among one of the few districts within the province that have a small surplus in which to reinstate some services in support of school sites and strategic priorities. The prior two budget cycles have spoken to the impacts felt from the pandemic and resulted in required cuts in order to meet our legislated mandate to submit a balanced budget. Leading into the 2020-2021 uh, budget year, the board contingency, contingency fund was $1.2 million conservatively set aside to meet the system needs should something unanticipated occur. 21-22 saw this contingency utilized to meet growing pressures related to COVID, increases in sick and absence benefits and inflationary costs. 22-23 saw our district in a deficit position of $2 million requir requiring significant cuts to services. This financial tightening of the belt system-wide saw our district weather the storm with as few impacts to classrooms as possible. These cuts were uncomfortable, challenging, and not something that any member of the senior leadership team or board chose, but they were necessary. 23-24 saw our finances stabilized with the ability to offer a new program through the in-reach outreach team in response to growing complexities of classrooms and requests for additional supports. Moving into the current budget year, I acknowledge that the needs are great, and that no one priority is more or less important than another. When the board considers recommendations from the executive leadership team, its first priority is always what is best and most equitable for children. We entrust the senior team to gather the information from the field 
compile the feedback from all rights holders, employee groups, senior and school-based leadership, the Indigenous Education Council, and parental and student voice for presentation with their recommendations based on alignment with strategic priorities, classroom and school-based needs, and current <laughs> fiscal position. Tonight, the board will evaluate and be provided public time to ask questions of the senior team prior to the completion of costing and final budgetary number calculations. This process is designed to be responsive, accountable, and publicly transparent. Any questions can be addressed at the end of this meeting or via a follow up from the business department prior to the final budget vote on May 28th. And finally, this upcoming weekend sees us enjoying the first of summer's long weekends. I wish everyone a relaxing three days with our return marking the final six weeks of the 23-24 school year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> On to Superintendent's remarks. Thank you, Chair Eddie. It's like really hard to believe we're zooming into our final six weeks and what a beautiful night to be uh, in Campbell River. Uh, I, I spoke last time about uh, the professional development opportunities that were available uh, last week um, in the school district. And I just wanted to share uh, with the board uh, the incredible experience that I had as I was able to go with Ecole Phoenix Middle School uh, on a tour of local indigenous sites of significance, of historical significance, uh, and it was a, a boat tour. And so we loaded up into uh, two boats uh, and two Zodiacs. I believe there were about 61 of us all together that had that opportunity. Uh, we traveled all the way around Sonora Island. Uh, we saw some uh, significant historical sites for the Liguido people um, and just had a really great time with the <coughs> Phoenix staff. I think uh, it really emphasized what a beautiful place we live in and, and what a beautiful territory this is. Um, we got all kinds of weather uh, from pelting rain to beautiful sunshine, uh, and we saw all kinds of wildlife, uh, dolls, porpoises, harbor porpoises, a couple of humpback whales, uh, seals, sea lions, eagles. Uh, and I think it was really grounding for all the, the staff that uh, took part in it uh, to recognize that there have been people here for thousands and thousands of years before us living in some of the most remote, inaccessible areas and doing so very, very successfully. I think all of us came back with a deeper appreciation uh, for the local Indigenous people uh, and, and what they have endured uh, over the years. Um, and I know it, I hope also hope that it built more of a kinship uh, towards those people mm -hmm. as we look forward to working with them uh, in the future uh, and currently today. So I just wanted to share that it was a wonderful experience. I wanted to thank uh, the principal, Rachel Nelson of Phoenix, for organizing uh, such a fantastic event uh, with Dee Cullen, who's an archivist and also uh, a historical reference person, uh, historical keeper of knowledge for uh, We Will Kai and We Will Come. So thank you. I want to thank the district for that opportunity. It was fantastic. And I just wanted to point out one other thing, another fantastic event, a uh, different end of the spectrum. Uh, but last week we had uh, the careers evening at NIC that was very well attended, despite the fact that it was a, a Vancouver Canucks hockey uh, playoff game. I still had great attendance there. And for anybody who was not able to make that, uh, we have placed on our website uh, a synopsis of that meeting, but also a slide deck of 14 slides that parents can still go through and students can go through and take a look at what they missed, see opportunities that are available. Uh, so I would just encourage uh, families to check that out, look at the website and, and check out the careers night because there's still lots of great information online uh, and it's not too late to access those programs. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Superintendent Manning. Moving on to the approval of the minutes of the meeting of April 30th, 2024. Uh, Trustee Gladish, seconded by Trustee Gillis. All those in favor? Is there any business arising from the minutes? Seeing none, are there any additions or alterations to the agenda? No. Nope. And on to the approval of the agenda. May I have a mover, please? Trustee Gillis, Trustee Harper, all those in favor? 
and Vice Chair Gillis, report of board decisions from May 14th, 24 confidence. Yes. Uh, we dealt with teaching, administrative, and support staff changes, and property, legal, and financial Thank you, Vice Chair Gillis. There is no correspondence or public or agenda submissions. We're down to 11A, which is the Accessibility Committee. Superintendent Manning. Thank you, Chair Eddie. Um, tonight I have the opportunity and the pleasure to present our accessibility plan uh, to the board. Um, and um, I'm going to do it uh, through our webpage so that everyone that watches this uh, or eventually watches it will know how to navigate uh, to get to our accessibility plans. Excuse me for just a moment. Uh, so when you hover to our main page, you go up to our district. Accessibility in our schools. And you get an over overview of accessibility in the school uh, district. And then right here we have uh, uh, an icon for the accessibility plan 2024. And that's what we're going to be speaking about today. Uh, so first of all, I just want to give uh, a huge kudos to Jennifer Patrick, our communications manager, uh, who has been instrumental in, in helping with this accessibility plan and planning all the accessibility uh, committee meetings. Um, there are nine members of the accessibility committee, and I think out of all nine members, I am the only one who doesn't directly work on a daily basis. Uh, with someone with a disability or is not related directly to someone with a disability. So I feel very privileged to be part of of this team. Uh, we meet uh, five times a year. Uh, we are coming up on our fifth meeting uh, next week. Uh, and this accessibility uh, plan outlays our commitment to accessibility in the district. Uh, it has live links embedded that takes us to the Accessibility Act. Uh, and and the um, laws that were created around that. Uh, this first page just speaks about our commitment to accessibility, and I'm not going to read those word for word, but really uh, what that embodies, what all those statements embody, is that School District 72 wants to be a very accessible school district, and, and we have a commitment through our grant process, through our annual <laughs> facilities grant, to put monies towards accessibility and improving the accessibility uh, in our school district. I'll get to that a little bit as we go through the report. We thought it was uh, important to have a definitions page uh, because sometimes, you know, uh, accessibility, accessibility committee, the plan, disability, barrier, impairment, these words get interchanged sometimes. Uh, so we have uh, a page of definitions uh, that talks about, uh, for instance, barriers, and there are many types of barriers because the accessibility plan is not only supposed to help uh, for physical accessibility, it's also uh, mental uh, disabilities as well. Uh, we need to have a, a broad scope when we're looking at accessibility in our school district and in a school system. Uh, some of those uh, mental uh, disabilities that you don't see are the ones that we really have to focus on addressing. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what our, our actual uh, audit team looks like uh, towards the end, uh, but some of the barriers, physical environmental barriers, there's also attitudinal barriers. So attitudes towards people who have disabilities sometimes gets in the way of their learning and their ability uh, to uh, feel welcomed in our schools. I talked a little bit about the accessibility uh, committee uh, before, uh, and I just wanted to point out the people who are actually on this year's committee. It's uh, a three year commitment. We will renew membership on the committee every three years. And if we have a need that arises throughout a year, someone has to drop off the committee because they have other commitments. Uh, we will seek new membership uh, throughout when we need to. Uh, but it's myself, Jennifer Patrick, our uh, communications manager. Uh, Beth Newton, who's an educational assistant in our school district. Deb Barris is a vice principal in our school district. Jolene Gallagher is a signing interpreter and a parent uh, in our district. Letitia Martin 
is one of our bus drivers, and more specifically, she is the driver for uh, the disability bus. Uh, Linda Sturrett is the teacher of visually impaired. Uh, Natalie Raid Wolf Pogue is an LST uh, in our school district, and Sandra Maxwell is a lead EA mentor. Those are the nine people that make up the committee. Uh, and I have to say it's a very diverse group of people who really come to those meetings uh, with a broad perspective on what accessibility looks like. And they all come at it from a little bit different angle, depending on what their area of expertise is. OK, so what we've done today, like there are the live links there, Accessibility BC Act and the Accessible BC Regulation. You can click on those and get, if you're a person that's really interested in the fine detail, that'll give you all the detail uh, on what that act and regulation put into place for all school districts and public institutions. Uh, one of the things I really like that uh, Jennifer created was a feedback mechanism. Uh, so you can uh, click and accessibility at sd72.bc.ca uh, email link. And if you have any questions about accessibility at any of our schools or any of our buildings or on any of our properties in School District 72, you can send an email and every single one of those emails uh, is responded to. We bring those emails to the Accessibility Committee and we have a discussion on uh, what kind of issue it is, what we could brainstorm around uh, potentially solving that. And that is open 24 seven all the time. It has been open uh, since the fall. Uh, we do have a, a three year uh, plan. Uh, priority one was gathering feedback and identifying initial barriers. Uh, we have been gathering the feedback, as I mentioned, through that uh, email link. Um, we have been identifying barriers and we've come up with a an initial uh, accessibility audit list that I'll, I'll share with you towards the end of the presentation. Uh, priority two is the build environment uh, and accessible schools and district facilities. As I mentioned before, uh, we've already set aside money in our uh, annual facilities grant uh, for accessibility issues. Uh, I believe uh, the high schools and middle schools are uh, having all of their accessible doors uh, looked at to make sure they're working or if they're they don't have uh, a second door putting one in uh, that work is set to happen in the next school year as part of this as well in the annual facilities grant uh, we've also done a really deep dive and look at all look at all of our washrooms in the school district uh, making them more accessible and safe and there's been uh, Substantial amount of budget set aside for that. I believe next year's budget has $275,000 set aside for that work and ongoing uh, in the years after. Uh, priority three is developing a common understanding of accessibility and, and what the common terms are and, and how we go about uh, making our school district more accessible. Uh, we will continue to monitor and evaluate and we always will have that uh, feedback loop uh, set up uh, for people to be able to contact us and and it's a good way for us to respond as well and i just wanted to share uh, with the board um, we, we built a, a basic accessibility audit kind of 1.0 uh, where we want to look at, focus on uh, physical accessibility in all our schools, focusing on entrances and exits, making sure there's at least uh, one accessible entrance uh, ramp that is uh, level entry, no steps through the front door uh, and tied to dignity. So we, we don't want any of our students who have accessibility issues to have to go in a side door or a back door or down uh, way off into some alley to get into our schools. In parking and drop off areas, uh, we want to make sure we have availability for handicap parking. And once again, that, that parking is set in a place that's accessible. There's no point in having handicap parking that someone gets out of the car and they have to navigate stairs uh, to get into the school. Uh, and I know we've also put a big emphasis on in winter months to make sure those areas are clear, clear and free of ice and snow. Um, we have had times in the past where we had uh, some of our contractors who were unaware 
uh, dumping the excess snow right into those handicapped spots. So we've addressed that and, and we're going to continue to monitor that. Uh, we also have a uh, topic on pathways and hallways, making sure they're uh, accessible and there's sufficient width uh, in those walkways. Uh, stairways and elevators. So we want to make sure if there is a lift in our schools that it is operating uh, properly, it's functional and it's working. Um, I already mentioned the money we put aside for restaurant restrooms and washrooms. Uh, we are going to continue to do that work in the next five years. Uh, we're going to focus on emergency systems, make sure there is adequate emergency systems, especially in those schools where uh, maybe we have someone who has a hearing impairment, for instance, and they need a flashing light uh, to be installed so they're aware that an emergency is taking place. Uh, and signage, making sure we have signage in all of our buildings and exploring things like do we have our signs in Braille? Do, do we have uh, a washroom map for a student to, who may be visually impaired that they can feel the layout of that washroom and go in the washroom with confidence? Uh, and then there's also public and common areas. What are some accessibility challenges in those areas? Uh, so we're uh, hoping to form audit teams and we'd love to get this work started <coughs> before the end of the school year. Uh, we do have our Excel accessibility plan mapped out for next year in terms of uh, hitting the two secondary schools and middle schools. But our goal is by next year to have a, this audit team to go through every single one of our sites and have these basic uh, topics covered. It, it is a work in progress and it's, it's going to take uh, a lot of consistent efforts uh, to see it through, but we think it's very worthwhile. Just wonder if the board has any questions. Sure. For those facilities that were built long before accessibility mm. was even a whisper or a thought, um, I'm thinking specifically of some of our older school buildings. Mm. Um, has the ministry set forward with any kind of potential funding to address to address the size of the hallways or the fact that there aren't large enough washrooms for accessibility? That is a question the Accessibility Committee asked, and we said no, they have not. Uh, as of yet, there's there's been no funding that's come along with this. But, yeah. Well, one thought, though, I do recall um, in the 90s, before there was an elevator, and we had a student who was in a wheelchair, and that elevator was built up ultimately, or was included in the plan. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make a comment. I'm just so taken with the I think the importance of this in terms of being accessible to all students. I have a cousin a couple of years older than I am, which would make her very old because I am old. And she was born totally blind. And she began her schooling in Vancouver at the Jericho Hill School of Deaf and Blind. And then her mother said, no, she's coming back to her home community, Williams Lake. This is back in the 60s. And in those days, there was no such thought about accessibility. When I would walk with her, it was always Diana. There's a curve coming up or there's a this or there's a that. And when you look at our community and our schools now through this lens, I think we've come a long way. And uh, I appreciate particularly if you could convey to those members of this committee. Mm -hmm. That's a huge um, moral imperative. They are making a, a difference in the life chances yeah. of, of all of our students. So, yes, thank you. Thanks. And then the passion that the committee members have is very evident yes. in those meetings. So, thank you. I'll pass that along. I'm really impressed with the work you're doing. Um, I encourage me that sometimes, you know, um, there might be a fire or some need for an evacuation and mm -hmm. is this sort of part of the accessibility and plan in terms of making sure that there are children who require extra help and uh, require to get wheelchairs through is, is that all sort of part of the plan yeah and that that this would be probably augment those existing practices that we would have already had mm -hmm. for those students mm -hmm. uh, but definitely if, if there isn't a, a secure way for to evacuate a, a student this these plans will help with that mm -hmm. for sure okay yeah. sounds good thank you thank you superintendent manning and moving on to 11b 
career programs. And I'll allow you, Associate Superintendent Kyle, to introduce C. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Um, while my partner in crime uh, gets us going, I'll, I will give her an, an introduction that she thought was uncomfortable when I give her. She has been a godsend to us in our district around career programs. Uh, City Council is a CUPE member, and uh, we were from the last budget process, we went um, and, and had a, we call it career programs advisor. And I was thinking we have great people in our district, uh, but perhaps not with any career programs. And up came an application from Cindy, who was already in our district. Uh, but she did this work, the exact work, in Abbotsford for 10 years. Mm -hmm. 10 years. So came with all of the expertise and all of um, the experience in career programs. My experience uh, before going into administration was a career facilitator in Surrey as, as my full time job and, and the passion and uh, and the joy that uh, kids had and parents had coming to those of us in career programs because it is about after high school. So uh, both of us, as well as um, our two career facilitators at Timberline, which is uh, Jeff Lonteo and Donnie Fitzpatrick at Cary High and uh, new to career programs and new to the district is Jacob Miles and uh, Kate Guy. Kate has been there for a while at Rob Ron. So we've got a number of us that are working on career programs in our district. And uh, our career programs uh, night, information night, was in partnership with NIC. And our partnership that we've been working on in a really significant way, because they are just open arms around partnership. But I really want to uh, give a shout out to Cheryl O'Connell, who is the Dean of Trades and Technical Programs at NIC. We put together this idea of let's have this night and let's have it at NIC so they could be in this facility, because many of the things that we do or do credits are actually with NIC. Um, it was a Canucks first game, playoff game, or like yeah. of all the nights. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was saying to Cindy, I just hope we outnumber the staff from NIC, which was seven. So I just wanted to make sure there were at least eight. And then Cheryl and I were chatting and she goes, it's 20. I think we're going to get 20. And we started in a small room and people just kept coming down the hallway. So we were close to about 175 people that were at this night. Um, Kids are interested, parents are interested around information on anything in their school, uh, but certainly around career programs. So um, it was a great night. We're going to share in a much briefer way uh, what we shared on that night. Um, and so career programs is actually K to 12. There is curriculum for kindergarten. And um, I was career facilitating no better, but you know, kindergarten, they had this special day of people dressing up in firefighter and nurse and teacher and all these things and like what job do you want who do you want to be when you grow up rather than who are you and how does that match and that's how we have to start thinking of some things and you might have noticed I said firefighter police officer not fireman and policeman the genderizing around careers actually influences kids research shows us that ages five to seven kids have already genderized careers so language matters, even at that age. But we're going to focus more on the secondary component, and it's mostly grade 10, 11, 12. So there's work experience. Uh, it's WEX 12A and 12B, and that can be a paid work experience, so kids that are already in the work field. And we support them in that. And when we say we, um, we're supporting the people in the schools doing it, but it's around the world of work. Is that a match? Like you're working at said location is that your career path if it's not your career path what are you gaining out of this to move in that career path so work experience work in trades explore the trades explore the trades um, this sampler and the skills it's done at the school and so we'll go into more detail and then dual credit so dual credit is on the trades partnering with nic but it's also academic university dual credit so you could be taking english i'm just going to use the numbers that we all need English 100, biology 100, medical terminology. And so those dual credits are with NIC. We're, we're working on an um, MOU with Camosun, VIU. So the second, the post-secondaries are looking for kids for sure, and they are accommodating. So we're still working on that. So Cindy and I together, along with those in the schools, are really trying to build 
our career programs in our district. So um, just again, just the real brief piece is it can be paid or unpaid. If it's unpaid and kids are going like, I don't, I don't know where to go. I don't know how to do it. That's the facilitator's jobs in the schools, uh, finding placements for those kids, and particularly if it's in the career path. So if I want to be a vet, that's tough for a kid to go up and, and ask for a work experience. So facilitators will help set up those work experience placements for kids in their chosen career path. So policing. Uh, but if you want a part-time job, that's, that's on you to get. And we will facilitate the learning, how to do the resume, all of those pieces. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague. She'll be on about the others. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here because like Morgan, I share a real passion for career programs. I spent almost 10 years in the Abbotsford School District, so I'm really excited to be part of the potential here for all of our students. And so some of the other programs that we offer in this district is the Youth Explorer Trade Skills. So, so these are our students are enrolled in the school-based trades program. So it's either a Cary High or Timberline, and they, um, they can earn credits towards their graduation. So they get some practical hands-on experience in a variety of trades, and it's at least three trades in the programs. So most of them focus around sort of the construction, the carpentry, the welding, the electrical, the plumbing, and, and one of them does do a mechanics. So they get to learn about the different trades and the pathways available to them. So they also get a clear path before enrolling in one of the apprentice programs that we have at NIC. And they become strong candidates for the NIC trade sampler. The NIC trade sampler um, is is a rigorous program and the expectation for our students um, entering that program at NIC is that this is an adult world and the percentage that you require to pass is higher than school like it's not just 51 percent and you've passed it's 70 to 80 percent so taking it a, a trade skills at one of our schools just sort of prepares you um, for the potential of going into a program at North Island College and it allows you to see where you want to lean towards. Do you want to lean towards a welding trade? Do you want to lean towards a plumbing trade? So it's a really good opportunity for our students to stay in their school, um, have their classes with their classmates and be able to try out a variety of trades. And very similar to uh, the experience is what we call Youth Work and Trades. So Youth Work and Trades is a combination of high school with paid part-time employment in the trades. So students receive uh, credit towards their apprenticeship and they receive credit towards graduation. So students can start their apprenticeships in grade 10, 11 or 12. Um, they graduate the program with 16 high school credits and 480 hours towards their apprenticeship. It gives them a head start on earning their trade certification. There are over a hundred trades that are applicable to this, and a lot of our students don't even recognize that they're actually working in a trade. So, you know, when you start to have that dialogue with students about, oh, hey, do you have a job? Oh, hey, where is your job? Oh, I work at a restaurant. Oh, what do you do in a restaurant? Oh, I work as a dishwasher. Oh, you also do some prep cook sometimes. Yes, yes, I do some prep cook. Aha, now we can get you on the path towards apprenticeship because it uh, used to be that there had to be a Red Seal chef on site and now it doesn't have to be a Red Seal mm -hmm. chef to sign off. So we can kind of, when we start to have those conversations with students, we can start to get them on a career path yeah, for sure. year. So students could also be eligible for a thousand dollar award from Skilled Trades BC after they do about 900 hours and they can also pursue level one trades training with free tuition through the school district. And so there's two uh, programs at North Island College. There's the foundation and then the level one trades training. So foundation is exactly what it says it is. It's just sort of a, a foundational program for students who have never worked in the trades. And then the level one is actually the second step 
of the foundation program. So it gets them that further ahead. And so part of the process this year is to kind of tap into some of our hidden apprentices that we know we have in our district. Um, we currently only have a few students on the books, but we know that we have many students who are most likely working in a trade. So that's something that we're going to be working on in June is to kind of sign up those students and have those conversations with them. So the great thing is, is that they can get paid to work in a trade and receive their high school credits because of it. And the trade samplers, um, currently we are only um, doing trade sampler at North Island College, but there is the potential to do uh, trade samplers uh, online and then students will do part of their schooling at like let's say a local auto body shop um, it's typically a three-month program um, tuition is paid students are responsible for for their gear such as steel toed boots but we don't want that to ever be a barrier for our students so through skilled trades bc we do have some funds that are available uh, for any of our dual credit programs that students can access it. So it can be for books, it can be for some of the gear they need or the lab fees. So the nice thing about the trade sampler is it is a stepped up version of the skills exploration that we offer in the schools. So they gain hands on experience. They receive workplace skills training. They receive safety training. They receive industry certifications. So that can be things like WIMIS, first aid, some of the programs offer forklift and so they have to be under the age of 19 on june 30 for the upcoming year of sponsorship and they have a possibility of apprenticeship and certainly employment and then they are also a strong candidate for youth train and trades so much like we offer in the schools it is a sample of trades and so it can be welding metal fab plumbing electrical auto heavy duty mechanics. The biggest difference is that this is in North Island College. So you kind of remove students from the school environment and then you put them in adult environment and they get the opportunity to see what it is like to be in a college, to have professors as their teachers and to be in a real adult world where the expectations are a little higher than the school district sometimes. And lastly, we have dual credit and I'll just carry on. OK, so so we have two dual credit programs. We have the, the trade certificate and we have academic. And so students are enrolled as both a post secondary student and as a high school student, and they earn credits for both. So much like some of our, our youth train and trades and our trade sampler, um, tuition is paid. Uh, the books, their student fees, their learner resources are paid by the student. But again, we do not want that to be a barrier for any of our students, and we do have the funds available for that. So there's a there's a few musts that students have to do in order to participate in dual credit, and you know most importantly, they have to <laughs> complete an education transition plan. We want this to be a good fit and a match for kind of what their interests are. So. So all the dual credit sort of has to align with the career path that they're really interested in. Um, they have to meet all the post-secondary academic prerequisites. And so this is where timetabling is really important and meeting with their career facilitators is really important. <laughs> some, of the, um, some of the dual credit programs, particularly the trades, is that you have to have math 10 or 11 before you can get into the trade. So that's why the earlier we can start with the students, the better. We can start having these conversations um, grade nine for sure, but grade 10 really rolling out some information sessions. Like let's get you thinking about, you know, the, the path that, that you could be on. And, you know, the students have to follow the post secondary criteria on attendance, personal responsibility, communicating with their instructors. And they are learning in an adult environment, so they have homework, they have to study, and they cannot miss classes. So there's no kind of 
oh, your paper was due yesterday, but we'll give you another week. No, your paper was due yesterday. So it really sets them up for some future success in a post-secondary environment as well. And so some of our dual credit programs, of course, are the youth train and trades. It is industry training in the foundation or level one. Currently, we are only running through our college. Um, it's the easiest uh, place for, for students to kind of do their, their trades at because it's a full time college during school hours, Monday to Friday, and it's anywhere from five to 10 months, depending on the program that they take. Our second dual credit, of course, is the academic. Students can take up to three classes or a certificate program or a program prerequisite. So um, the ECCE is probably one of the most popular ones that, that students like to take. Um, but we are also um, looking at doing, like uh, Morgan said, some MOUs with Camosun, and they, or they offer things like medical <coughs> terminology. So we're really trying to expand the, the types of programs that we can offer our students. And the, the, the most important thing about the dual credit programs is it does not follow the school district timetable. It follows the college or university timetable. So again, students have to do some pre-planning in that area because the university or college classes start January and not February like the school district. So a lot of our programs do tend to be taken after school in the academic. <coughs> So these are some of the sample uh, dual credit programs students can take at NIC. So, you know, there's a plethora of choice for students. Um, you know, auto service, cook, electrical, uh, carpentry, plumbing. Um, some of the potential pathways we're working on in the academic realm is um, uh, English, biology, human services, social services. You know, and importantly for our school district, if we could kind of create um, you know, a win-win situation where we um, are, you know, really offering students the, the chance to do the education assistant and those types of things. And then, you know, as a school district, we have the potential to offer them some work experience placement, you know, and it gives them a chance to really see what it's like. It gives us a chance to, you know, observe them as a potential employee. And then, of course, office admin medical terminology, like it's limitless. What we could actually offer our students in in the dual credit realm. And so, yeah, so there is a bit of a, an application process, but most importantly, we encourage students to meet with their career facilitators and start these discussions as soon as they possibly can. Did I mention to you some things? <laughs> I had some experience and expertise. Okay. Um, just a couple of your shout outs that, that we have. We've got a North Island um, group of career educators that uh, Cindy and I meet with, uh, I think we've met three or four times now, who have been just really, really helpful in us building up our programs as, as strong as they are in, in the districts around us. So we're really appreciative of those folks. Um, again, with partnerships, the Ministry of Education is, is um, giving grants possibilities. So we put in a $200,000 grant in partnership with NIC, and it is for uh, students who are underrepresented, marginalized, uh, so doing some spring break, some summer to give people tastes as well as some programming. I uh, just completed a grant two weeks ago for ECE. Uh, again, the ministry is really trying to target with other ministries those areas where we know we're short in, in um, British Columbia. So uh, there will be a health care grant coming out in the fall that uh, we will uh, diligently do a grant for that one, but the ECE and the trade. So you can see the ministry and the province is really trying to work together to try and address some economy pieces that we have in our district, but or in our province, but also really giving opportunities to kids. So um, we're just we're, we've got a goal of like doubling what we've got. We've got a we've got you know some some really passionate people, but our numbers of students taking these opportunities is not as as high as it uh, could be. So we're really working hard to make sure that we uh, get in the hundreds uh, going into next year and the year beyond. So we've got a, a pretty um, aggressive plan to get that done, but it is for kids' benefits to stay local because there's lots of our kids that want to stay here. So let's get them into things that can keep them here in, if they choose to be at home. <clears throat> so any questions for us? I have a burning question. 
<laughs> it has to do with the academic dual credit. And I have never understood why there can't be some kind of partnership around that January, February date. Can a student take English 151 in September enrollment and therefore complete it before they start second semester courses? As as we grow, we can buy cohorts. So yeah. we can say, look, we've got enough kids sure. to run a cohort. So they need to have an instructor and then we can run it in our timetable. We're also looking and had conversations with SB 71 to yes. combine a cohort together so that they do fit high school yeah. credits. But um, at, at this point, we're not at that place where we can say that we are going to buy one without knowing that we've got that registration, but it might the following year. So yes, it's possible, but right now we're fitting into their timetables. Uh, I'm just wondering if students who live, for example, since um, Cortez or Quadra, are they able to do some kind of a work experience or something within the community that they live in? Everything is possible. Oh, <laughs> so that's been done. It's possible. Okay. <laughs> good. If, if we had a student yeah. that was doing that, that's the work that facilitators yeah. would be doing. Okay. Mm -hmm. With the help of saying, do you have any family connections? Do you have anybody that I can call on behalf of? Sure. But yeah, it's absolutely, it's, it's endless possibilities. Not to be negative, but for the student who enrolls mm -hmm. in an NIC program as an adult learner, um, who doesn't find success or flakes out of it, do we have a mechanism to streamline them back into our, our high school systems to kind of lessen the impact of the lost time? It depends on how far into a program they are. If it's, we've had some students that like after we get this is not for me, not many, many actually do complete and it is life changing. One student that stands out in my mind, I knew quite well um, and that's not necessarily a good thing if I know them that well. But in the way that I knew this, this student, um, completely different individual after going through those programs. So if somebody's going into three months mm -hmm. and they're going, I can't do it, that's difficult because the semester has already gone so far ahead at the high school. But we will accommodate, we will make, you know, whether it's it's a short term at Robron to work on those courses, it'll really depend on where in that program they are. How about transition in the back? And is there any financial cost to a student if they've enrolled in a trades program and withdraw? I know that it's funded through the K-12 system, but what if they're halfway in and they're like, that's the ministry and skill trades BC have factored in that not all that register are going to be successful throughout the end. And that's our role on what are the barriers? What support do you need? Um, if they're students with uh, any sort of IEP, we work at the college on that as well as a student and we will support him in school to make sure that they get through. We want to remove those barriers as much as possible. And also NIC has a really great support mm -hmm. system for yeah. our students. They have a, a student liaison person that touches base with all of our students and just mm -hmm. make sure that everything is going well and sort of how can we sort of preempt anything that might not be going well for students. So there, so there really is a lot of wraparound support for students entering these programs because we want them to be successful. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you so much okay. for the information. Thank you. Thank you. All right. On to agenda item 12A, which is the District Parent Advisory Committee workshop. And I did mention it in my opening remarks. But on May 24th at the Sportsplex, um, they, uh, DPAC will be hosting a workshop encouraging parents that may be interested in sitting packs or are already engaged in packs to come out with their kids. Supper will be provided. There'll be um, activities for the children. They're also encouraging anyone from the education community to come. Um, it's a really great way to have conversations directly with parents and because their theme is it takes a village they're asking um they're asking members to share their story how are you involved in education um where your where do your passions lie around um k-12 education so it it proves to be a good event i believe that they may, there may be some information that goes out through the school district 
Yes, once they provide it. <laughs> okay. just once the once the information comes through the school district, it'll be shared out with parents and um, and hopefully they'll get a good turnout. Yeah. Um, are, are you looking for um, the tax members or parents or is it whoever whomever want, would like to attend? Whoever would like to attend. Okay. Parents that are interested in understanding a bit more what PAC is and how they might contribute. Um, people that want to share their education experience. They're just looking to okay. to build the village around kids. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we, we did receive invitations, so something must be out there. Perfect. Okay. Um, there are no education uh, issues. We're on to presentation of the 24-25 operating budget. Secretary Chair. We have a new setup. And I don't know what that means. To, uh, oh, is that me? Yeah. So I'd like to present uh, the budget recommendations for 24-25, which is next um, next school year and our next fiscal year. And um, so the, the first part that I want to do is this is in your package. Um, that is really thank everybody that participates in the budget process. Uh, we start our budget in March. Um, we have a fairly extensive consultation process with the Indigenous Education Council, uh, CRDTA, QB, DPAC, students, principals, and exempt staff. And we have about 20 meetings over March, April, and May to gather feedback. Uh, the board's process for budget is that charges and asks management senior leadership to gather feedback uh, and make recommendations to the board and aligning that with um, with the board's strategic priorities. So this is really a summary of all that work uh, and the feedback that we've gathered. Um, so we are quite lucky to be adding because I have still not heard of another district that's in the same situation uh, that, that we are. Um, so this um, this budget process rolled out asking for uh, uh, additions, service additions. We also do ask for potential reductions or, or reallocations, but we typically don't get this. So on the sheet, first off, we start at the top. Um, we have strategic priority it's listed there. Um, priority, we haven't identified as a one, two, and three which we actually don't do in a strategic plan because they're all important. But for the purposes of the budget, um, when we need to identify which priority it supports, I did have to order them as a one, two, and three. So not in importance, but more for reference. Um, so priority, then the first one listed is on, on our Indigenous worldviews and perspectives. Um, so number two is student-centered learning environments. And number three is evolving for tomorrow. So transparency is important. It's actually, for me, one of the most important things. And when we started this process on March 15th, we had about $532,000 uh, available. Um, and as we work on the budget and we're gathering the feedback, other things will come up that potentially may impact, and we have to account for those adjustments. So um, the first one was, when we prepared for the beginning of the process, we didn't have the HR's department budget updates. So we had to put that in and that reduced it $33,000. Then we found that we had double booked uh, strategic priority entry in school supplies. We backed that out, that actually gave us another 50. Uh, but then each week we seemed to get more and more cost increases that were more and larger than we had and then I got a letter saying that uh, our digital services recovery was going up an additional $57,000 a year. So right now, as presenting to you, we have $493,000. So 
This is for the preliminary budget of next year, because I can guarantee you that tomorrow we'll have something else that probably makes that 493 like sure. <clears throat> and what we do is we will work those new items into the final budget, uh, because in the final budget we bring in February, <coughs> we'll know exactly what our student counts going to be. We'll know exactly what our teacher costs are going to be, and we'll be able to work that stuff in. So this is at this point in, in time. Um, the other thing with the uh, the transparency <laughs> is all the feedback and I commit that all the feedback we received, we do summarize. So you trustees have seen many, many summarized schedules, but we also provide <clears throat> the actual raw feedback. And you have received that feedback throughout the process with the latest being uh, feedback that came in last week that is in this package. So we've just received the updates so that I'm not continually giving you two, three, four hundred um, pages, but uh, but you've been getting updates as we go along. So the um, so today is just about showing uh, the proposed additions. It's not looking for a motion because we present this at public and we mm -hmm. are looking and it gives the opportunity for public to comment on it, uh, but we'll look for the board to pass a full budget at the next. <laughs> so. That will include these items that I'm about to speak to will be part of that budget. You'll see on here further down, there are some other items that actually won't be looked to for the board for approval, but there are other items that we were able to um, address some other uh, items. So this year's budget process, we had um, 340 different recommendations. It was double what we had the year prior. Uh, about $4 million worth of asks, and we have $500,000. So um, budget um, is about choices, it's about priorities, and we do our best to identify and address and support uh, based on the board's strategic plan. And really, it's all about improving outcomes for kids. So, um, so we, uh, these are some of the things that came out of what we had been uh, looking at. So with the additions, they are in order. Normally I don't do high to low with when I sorted it for some reason and did that and I just didn't um, change it back. Uh, so the first one is um, mechanic succession. So we have a mechanic uh, and we have more work than that mechanic and handle. So we are proposing that um, the board add $20,000 and that doesn't actually, that's not his full salary. <laughs> So we are looking to add a full-time mechanic, um, but you can see the note that we do have to contract out a lot. We have a lot of vehicles uh, and more work than what our current mechanic can handle. Uh, so we contract out a lot, and by adding a second mechanic, we will be able to reduce that contracting out. And as you can see, the succession piece is, um, it will provide a succession plan for our current mechanic as he's nearing retirement age. So that continuity is really important. Um, it will lead to, I think, better service for vehicles, including buses, uh, to, to support our students. Um, next item, outdoor education coordinator, point two. It did, on this list, everything here actually came from feedback from others. Um, and we were, senior leadership was able to prioritize those. So, of course, one of the requests was outdoor education coordinator. Now, point two is only one day a week, uh, but it will be a start. Outdoor <clears throat> education, environmental sciences was an item that came up a couple of times, uh, quite a, say a number of times in the requests. Uh, payroll level in position increase. So this is moving from a supervisor's position, just keeping one position, but um, making it a manager. The complexity and the volume number of employees that we've been adding over the number of over the past number of years have uh, changed dramatically. Um, the number of reports that keep being asked, same thing every week. There's a new report uh, is getting more um, getting more complex. So districts our size typically have the structure of payroll managers amongst a payroll department our size. And we're looking for the board support to um, uh, to support that. Indigenous knowledge keeper. So this is adding um, additional knowledge, uh, additional indigenous uh, support outside of targeted funds. 
So Indigenous Ancestry um, actually has supported a $2.3 million program uh, in our Indigenous Ed Department. But the board over the past couple of years has identified a number of Indigenous supports in addition to the targeted funds. And really it is showing and honoring the number one. Uh, it's, it's the board putting money to show support uh, to Indigenous um, uh, initiatives. Now this actually will be expanding a current knowledge keepers time that we have. So it's not actually a net new position, but we will get more of that person in, in our district. Uh, point to the Beaver Phoenix. Um, so this actually is somewhat of an evolving piece. Uh, but you'll see down below, this came up based on an opportunity. There was some funding available at that school uh, that is being combined with this request that will, um, that's actually coming from Indigenous, from indigenous uh, funds, combined with this and also combined with another item down below that will allow us to add um, a principal. So the ask from the board is for at least one uh, point two um, uh, to be in the budget, but it will be combined with others to provide uh, basically a position, a full position uh, split between two schools. Uh, school allocation. So when we had our very difficult year two years ago and we had to reduce by $2 million, we reduced school, um, school supply allocations. And at the time we did that because they actually had substantial savings in their reserves. And when we did that, we asked them to basically use their reserves before looking at considering this. Last year when this rolled around, we didn't hear that that needed to be reversed at that time. As you can recall last year, we actually made a small reduction, but didn't have a lot of additions. So we didn't replace it at that time, but we heard clearly this year, very early in the year, that uh, the schools are now at a point where they need that back. Um, as you know, uh, inflation is is running rampant and that impacts what schools can do. So this is definitely uh, time for that. And then I've got a little comment over on the side that says um, school and family affordability. So field trips are something that has come up um, and we've supported it field trips in various manners in the past. Historically, field trips were parent responsibilities. We did get a period of funding where we were able to help offset those costs, but in that cut of uh, a couple of years ago, we did have to reduce that support. Um, so we aren't able to fully restore what we had, but what we have identified is to take school and family affordability. We're gonna get an extra sort of one-time amount of $100,000 that we're gonna split into two years, and we're gonna use it to support schools where they have a greater need. So again, parents usually uh, provide support for, um, for field trips, some schools that demographic uh, and um, is a little bit more difficult to support that and we will try to direct more funds to those schools. All schools will get some funds. Uh, the ERP. So this is actually the number two item that came up on request. And so the ERP is our SIM system. It's our, our business software system. Um, so it handles payroll, it handles finance, it handles HR. Employees, when they wanted to see their paychecks, it goes through there. T4s goes through there. If you're going to book an absence, it goes through there. Uh, and we have a system that's 30, well, it's well over than 30 years, but we've had it for about 30 years. And the individuals who run that, fabulous people, has definitely benefited the school district, but it's coming. When you say end of life and you're talking about people with a product, it actually sounds really just sad. <laughs> but let's just say they're getting close to retirement age. And um, so there, there's a potential risk there. Um, and also I think part of the reason is um, like, when you kind of lived with it for so long, which I know it well, you said it's what I'm familiar with, but I think a lot of new staff coming in are looking for a different type of system that's more modern uh, with their interactions. So it came across a couple of different groups. It wasn't just business group, it actually came from um, like other stakeholders. So what this is, is $100,000 to uh, start getting us towards their 
We haven't done a request for proposal yet. We don't know what system is next, but what this will do is it will put us in a position uh, to start looking at that. About two years ago, we had a group take a look at competing and uh, potential options to see if something would actually fill the gap. Nice thing with our current system is it does a lot of things. It's just doing it kind of as an aged, as an aged product. Um, but they did identify that there were products out there that could fill the gaps. All of them were more expensive than what we were, were using. Um, and so this, um, we'll do the RFP. If we can afford it, we'll proceed, but there is implementation costs. So we might have to just set this budget aside for next year, save it um, until we have enough for implementation and then are ready to proceed. But really this is, this is for tomorrow. This is for the future. The last thing you want to be done, want to have happen, is get caught with uh, six months notice that you have to switch systems. So this is uh, early preparation for this. Uh, and then numeracy coordinators. So that did come up. It actually came in part from the Mercury report that was presented as identifying uh, numeracy is requiring some supports. So that kind of takes us. $2,145 over. So that is what we will be asking the board to approve uh, at the next meeting. Um, now, so I mentioned we had $4 million worth of asks and we only had 500,000. So these items here are not actually going to be, um, we're not going to be asking the board to do it, uh, to approve it, but we have identified and we, why we did this is we wanted to identify that the senior leadership team has worked hard to address um, other sort of requests in different ways. Um, so the number one request was for a director of instruction. Now with, with um, uh, Associate Superintendent uh, Kyle retiring, um, there is an opportunity to replace that um, future salary with the rest of the function. So it's not actually an ad in um, in cost, but it will be replacing. Uh, and again, it was the number one request, and that's why we wanted to identify that we had found a solution for it. Uh, technology equipment. Um, this is a really this is similar to that year, beginning to a pretty critical need of replacement, um, uh, needing to build funds for replacement. So. We didn't have the funds to recommend it, but what we are identifying here is to maybe look at as a priority at the year end surplus and using some funds from that to do a year's allocation. Uh, elementary SEL stands for social emotional learning. So uh, one question that came out of this is, uh, is this a third position? So we have one SEL position in the budget. Um, this this current year we have a second SEL position, but it's focused towards middle school. What this item is is to look at um, replacing the middle school one with an elementary. And you can see over on the left, right hand side that it's going to come from inclusive education. So this year it also came from inclusive education. So what we do is. Um, there are times when, and we've referred to unfilled positions in the past, uh, but we, um, when we have, like this year when we're looking for next year, there are currently two specialty teaching positions within inclusive ed that are going on leave and we know we won't be able to replace. So when that happens this year, we have identified an element or uh, a middle school social emotional learning teacher to replace that, to basically use those funds. Why we don't just collapse the position and move it up is because we want that person back. So the work they do is so special and it's so valuable that we leave the budget there, uh, but we just repurpose it for that year while they're, they're unavailable. Uh, and that is what we're doing with that elementary SEL, uh, as well as those other items that you see there. I know we, we have heard uh, of the challenges with unfilled positions with EAs. We do not budget to use any unfilled EA positions at this time. Um, our hope is, is that we'll have a full complement of casuals uh, and that 
all those funds will be spent filling those roles next year. But when it comes to specialty teachers in our town, our size, we know whether or not something will be available or not. So, so we try to utilize those uh, aging position funds. Um, so district librarian, uh, so the request was to not have full time, but we weren't able to support that at this time. So this will increase that position one extra day. Uh, it will work with the director of instruction um, uh, next year, and we do hope that the director of instruction, that new sort of relationship and department will help um, uh, give uh, give feedback on other further changes that are required for that district librarian position. Uh, and then VP carry high. So this is this is addressing and identifying. We, we've heard and actually I think you have seen some of the feedback asking for additional time. This doesn't quite get there because they want a full time position, but it helps to start. So this position with the VP position and with Indigenous Ed out of inclusive ed, we will have a person who will be able to support in an admin position, both Phoenix and Cary High next year. So um, it, uh, it, so it, it will be new um, and it's maybe not quite what everybody had hoped for, but at this time it is repurposed funds and it is what we can do. So, so that is um, here, uh, so that, between the two, we got one million of the four million, but still not quite. So, um, so unfortunately, we, we won't be able to address everybody's issues. Uh, but um, we have uh, uh, addressed the ones that management feel are the high barriers. Questions? Okay. Trustee mm -hmm. Gladish. Um, I'm wondering about the uh, VP position for Carrie High, and that it's going to share between. Here, here high in Phoenix, um, is there going to be some sort of specialized service or support that that VP is going to be responsible for if she or he is going between two schools? So I, I believe the intent, the opportunity really came about because of Indigenous funds that were available. Uh, so there is going to be a very large component for Indigenous support, and I can see that continuing on in an admin role as well. Um, so. You can see there's going to be some admin time. There will be some um, uh, Indigenous support time as well um, that will uh, support the two schools. Yeah. I'm really encouraged to see the New Mercy coordinator um, on that list. I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the, the focus or. Uh, I would have to reach yeah. out to. Will it be primarily elementary, elementary, middle, whole district? Um, I guess that's what I was just saying. I mean, ultimately, we would hope for the whole district, but that's a pretty big, yeah, pretty big job title. We currently have a posting out, and a lot of uh, of that will depend on who applies for the posting and what kind of expertise we okay. we get. But it, but it is that's really to address uh, some of the issues that we're hearing about in our FSA results. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, just a couple of questions around the ERP uh, program and the technology equipment. So I guess this question may not be for you. It may be for our technological wizard in the room. But the age of the old program, does it create potential cyber security risks for information? It had, but I believe a couple of years ago we moved it off of an on-site server. So um, Clayton, would you still say on the cloud, it has a higher than normal risk that may be mitigated with the newer program? I, I don't think it has a higher than normal risk. There definitely is a risk there. And I think looking at moving to a new system that's uh, SaaS based or in the cloud might, might be a better option. Uh, we're able to use different authentication procedures, which, which help. So I, I don't think that there's a greater risk. I just think that there's a risk transfer to go to it. <laughs> And a second tech question. So just for technolo technology equipment, um, this is something that has been on the forefront of my mind, S seeing our system, seeing our hardware and recognizing that we are, are it's aging. 
Um, so a question for you and budget, but also a question for ministry. Is there a mechanism where we as a board can advocate for the ministry to support perhaps through capital planning for technology? Oh, absolutely. So the replacement, identified equipment replacement cost annually, if you were to continually do it, I would say for a district our size is at a minimum of four hundred thousand dollars, and that should be treated now similar to our annual facility grants or our school enhancement capital programs, because it actually is it's approaching the scale of roofs and roofing. And at one point in time, roofing was the sole responsibility of school district maintenance. Then it was part of the annual facility grant. But now they actually fund it individually, and I really would appreciate support from trustees with that because I think it's time for, to have capital support from the Ministry of Education for devices. COVID proved how valuable that technology was to continue with learning, and we were very, I, I use the term lucky, but some of it is brave and smart to have gone to mobile technology just before COVID. It was very expensive, only seven million dollars at the time, and we hit that just in time, and that allowed us to continue education. So, looking forward, we know how important it is, and it'll only get more important. Thank you. These are just two little ones. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the first, the outdoor education coordinator, is that primarily someone working with other teachers or working directly with students? Do you uh, somebody? Yeah, I, I, I think the feeling was uh, for the point two to start off. It's really to take an environmental scan of what's happening in the district, what programs are currently being offered, and where we can move forward. Uh, so that position we believe will really lay the groundwork for a future growth in that area if it's, if it's necessary. Because we do have in our schools some outdoor classes yeah. Programs yeah. already, and so this will be that centralized now. As we live work. in an amazing environment. Yes. So this, yes. Now my other little, um, little question was, just a second, the district librarian, you mentioned that that's going to increase a day. What is it currently? It is uh, two days for two district days. librarian. This will take up yeah. three days. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just one more thought about the outdoor education coordinator, and it's because of uh, reading from students that you know they 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 want to be outside. They want mm -hmm. to be learning, and, and it's a way of keeping kids might otherwise take off and, and leave school. Um, I think it would be nice to, you know, see how much more we can expand that to mm -hmm. meet the needs of children in uh, just envir environmental exposure. Well, the feedback from the students was outdoor education does not actually need to be a course called outdoor education. Mm -hmm. They'd like to do their English outside, their yeah. um, mm -hmm. uh, other courses, the social studies outside. So mm -hmm. they would like to incorporate other um, uh, subjects and outdoors. I'd be willing to offer that heading rotos. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just a final question, Secretary Patrick. Uh, now that this has been presented publicly, if there is any feedback or any questions about the yes. recommendations, how can they how can the public ask? So they can send it to my office um, to Natalie Farshaw. She'll compile all the feedback. Um, if there's something to reconsider, uh, we'll discuss it as a senior leadership team. We will make sure that the board, all the trustees, get that yeah. feedback as well before the next. Now, this process is, um, it is up to the board approval. The next board meeting, if the board does not want to approve it, you can reject the proposed budget. Uh, and we have an opportunity to amend it and bring a new one back in June. So it's time that way to give the board the discretion. Thanks. Thank you so much, Secretary Treasurer Patrick, and to all of the um, all of the tables and all of the meetings and everyone who participated in contributing to the budget process for the 24-25 year. I've lost my agenda. Here we are. So um, also under business administration, we have uh, finance warrant number 10 dated April 30th, 2024.
there is a motion required to accept this. And again, I just want to compliment the change. Mm -hmm. It is much easier to engage with mm -hmm. than the very long, much longer version that used to come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so the finance warrant motion reads that the finance warrant number 10 dated April 30th, 2024 be accepted as presented. May I have a mover? A trustee Harper, trustee Gillis, all the, those in favor. Thank you. And at that time, at that time, that concludes our scheduled agenda items, but we do have room for questions. If nobody's watching the Canucks game, please. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are, are there any questions online? No. Um, yeah. Sorry, Deb Coons, um, here you can. Just a question, um, now that the recommendations are made public, um, does it preclude individual employees as a member of the public putting forward comments, questions, and whatnot um, through the mechanism of uh, public feedback. No, this is full public. This is um, uh, so we do uh, through the regular feedback process. We're open to feedback from, of course, our organized committees and meetings. Uh, we also at that time take feedback directly from individual teachers, which has been incorporated into the list. Uh, <laughs> and this one is open to everybody, staff, public, neighbors um, that okay. who are interested. Thank you. Hi, Andrea. Hi. Yeah. Um, so there was conversation about a partial administrative assistant peer mentor position. There's nothing listed here. Has it been taken off completely? Is it still being discussed? Where are we at with that? Um, so we have a proposal to address some of the issues uh, that were raised um, it, upon for that request, but the costs are so minimal uh, with that, that it's not something that we'll bring to the board. So um, we the request was for a mentor for uh, admin assistants, um, similar to the educational assistant mentor. Uh, we're not able to proceed at that time, but we've identified some of the really important items that were brought up. Uh, we're going to try to address it through a um, uh, on an as needed mentor process, which will identify three individuals who, when they are working in the role of a mentor, will receive a higher rate. Um, but at this point, we don't know how how much time is going to be required, how busy uh, and what item <coughs> they will be working on. We know what we would like them to work on. Uh, but what we hope is that through this next year, we'll be able to monitor uh, the work that they're doing and it will put us next year in a better position to identify whether that is a full time position or whether it continues to be a part time position or whether we continue with the model as we are currently looking at next year. So. Any further questions? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Andrea. All righty. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate your response. Um, so really wonderful presentations tonight. I, it's really got me thinking of a number of things and I'm going to want to touch base with both of those groups um, around some ideas that qp has been talking about for a long time. Um, but something that, that didn't fully get addressed that we have been pushing for for a long time is job opportunities for students with special needs. Um, QP created a position in partnership with Cardapple a number of years ago. That student has since been made a lifelong um, employee of the district and a key member. Um, very successful. We have lots of employees that are waiting for the opportunity to take on a student to be a helper or potentially someone who could be a fully fledged QP member, able to do that work. Um, and I know there's been many teachers that I've consulted with over the years that are passionate about this as well and 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 asking the district, you know, when are we going to start offering more opportunities for those students? So um, just wondering, Jeff, maybe you could respond to that because we don't have uh, actually more that we can respond to. Just if 
those conversations are happening at your tables as well. I, I've had a you know one off conversation uh, with a QP employee and I, I think the position of the school district is we're, we're very open to that kind of program. Uh, we just have to sit down and map out what that would look like and have a conversation and we're open to having that conversation. Let me just add to that. Probably what I didn't say in that is career programs for everyone. And in other districts, um, ones that I'm familiar with, uh, do have partnerships with QP and with uh, the, the DTAs mm -hmm. around students having access. And some districts have actually closed it from, from a new perspective. They're, they're not open to it, but I know that ours is. And so when we're thinking about career programs and growing it, it is for all mm -hmm. students. So part of the partnership that we have with NIP is for unrepresented uh, students and marginalized students uh, to get them some training and some qualifications to be able to go into all kinds of different areas. So it's very much on our radar. Um, yeah, very much on our radar. And, yep. and mine's just more of an announcement to let you know that you are stuck with me again next year for the 2024-2025 school year. I've been acclaimed as the CRGTA president for next year. The rest of my executive will be uh, tomorrow's our general meet, our annual general meeting where the rest of my executive will be chosen for some of the other positions that many of you folks uh, interact with. Uh, so I'll keep you posted after tomorrow, but I thought I would pass on that yes. about my position. Well, congratulations, Deb. Yeah. Looking we'll forward to your perky questions from yeah. the audience yeah. next year. <laughs> Andrea? Okay, my third and final. <laughs> um, so I have to say it was, it's really disheartening that North Island College is not prepared to engage in a program around EAs. I know Brenna has had that conversation. They're not willing to go there, but I'm hopeful that our district is going to look at some ways, some more creative ways to provide that, that opportunity. Uh, going forward that, you know, maybe we can access some of our own um, teaching staff to create a program whereby students can be doing that in their grade 12 year, just like easy and starting to work as EAs. I mean, this is the time to recruit is before they finish school to get them here. So that door may be opening with the partnerships that we're developing already. Um, so the EC, we've opened that door. Um, SB 71, we've had a conversation about um, combined piece because it's not just us, it's yeah. province-wide. Uh, so I, I, there's not going to be any movement this school year, but I'm confident that we will be able to get there into next year. Yeah, the North Island College, in the last number of months, we have really engaged in those partnerships. And so they know that we're a much more active partner than we've been in the past. So I think that may open up some some doors for us. So there's been some preliminary, preliminary conversation. Awesome. No questions from the public as everybody's watching the Canucks game. <laughs> and with that, I would like to motion in German. Mm -hmm. Trustee Harper, thank you so much for joining us this evening.